You are listening to a Geek Network interview. Be sure to hit the follow button to get notified when a new episode is available. You can also visit us at geek-network.com for your guide to the geek entertainment news you love. Created for geeks, by geeks, and remember to always geek responsibly. Hello, listeners. I just want to say I have a very uh, talented writer on today who I'm very excited to talk to. I have the wonderful Steve Orlando. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. What's going on? Not a whole lot. I just have a few questions for you here um, to get things started. Uh, but before we go there, can you tell us, uh, tell the listeners a little bit more about uh, your background and how you got involved with comics? Sure. Uh, I mean, I've been a comics fan since yeah, actually before I can read because I was picking them up at like flea markets and things. Uh, but when I was like two or three years old, just excited by the the costumes and the colors and all and all the and all the excitement and and all those things. So uh, it's been with me ne- nearly from the beginning. Um, and as for how I got into comics, uh, you know, believe it or not, I did eventually learn how to read and. <laughs> With that came things like Marvel's bullpen and 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 things like that in in, in the books I was reading. And that's how I learned that hey, there's people uh, behind these things. Not only is there people behind these things, but there's a lot of people behind these things. And I, you know, I, I was a bit, I, I would draw when I was younger, but eventually, um, when and Superman turned electric, there was this big article in the Syracuse New Times. Uh, pardon me, the Syracuse Post Standard, which is where I, I'm from originally, and. Uh, and it was about how they put together this, you know, this never before seen all new version of Superman that, of course, was never going to change back. And this sort of creative round table they ran, which in retrospect probably had like Dan Jurgens on it. I, I don't know. Or uh, Jose Marzen Jr. I can't really recall who they interviewed. Um, but that's when I really felt that writing was what appealed to me most because that was the first person holding the baton, right? Uh, And so from there, I was about 12 years old. Uh, I started going to Comic-Cons, Comic-Con International, uh, what was at that time Wizard World Philadelphia, and trying to meet pros and break in. Uh, And, and, you know, I I, I aim to be the the next gym shooter of comics, but I didn't get in until I was 29. It took 18 years uh, or more. Uh, So I I missed the gym shooter slot, but uh, unlike Jim, I'm still working right now. So so, so (laughs) in some ways... Uh, things worked out Um, and it was just you know nearly two decades of bringing scripts and pitches that I had gotten people to work on uh, bringing them to shows of people I trust getting critique taking it to heart and coming back six months or a year later with something new and uh, you know like many people trying to do something in the creative arts I probably quit a thousand times but uh, it was the thousand and first time uh, when I finally got something accepted uh, in in 2014. Actually, it's my my image book, Undertow, and at that point, that was like the key to get in the door because I finally had something to show the editors that I've been networking with since I was a kid. You know, look, now I'm professional. Uh, now you know and can show your superiors that I can finish a book and and bring something to completion in a professional manner. And that was sort of like the last piece of the puzzle they needed to sell me up the chain. So for, uh, from that, I pitched Midnighter at DC. Mm-hmm. And uh, from that book, um, all the gigs since have come. Uh, so and, 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 and hopefully will continue to come. Nice. Absolutely. That's awesome. And uh, we're relatively, you know, uh, the same age. So, um, you know, you kind of with your intro, you kind of brought up a couple of, uh, you know, follow up questions. So uh, going to cons, uh, since you've been about, you know, 12, 13 years, like, uh, what are some of the biggest changes you've noticed in uh, conventions? Well, I mean, the most obvious change is that a lot of the things that I was getting the shit kicked out of me for at that time are now super mainstream. So that's not just about cons, but uh, about our, our sort of, uh, our sort of, corner of the of the of the geek community in general you know i I went from getting stuffed in lockers because i like deathstroke to the locker stuffers at my 10-year high school reunion asking me if i knew about deathstroke because you know they were obsessed with they were obsessed with arrow uh and so so you know we've we've gone mainstream we have to in the words of leonardo dicaprio we have to go deeper we have to get nerdier now uh but 
So that's definitely change. Um, and for better or worse, you know, comic cons are many of them are mostly are are. It's not that they're not about comics now, but they're they're really pop culture cons. When I find mm-hmm. a con that is truly just about comics, I, that's like a unicorn to me now. Whereas that's what it used to be. You know, look at Wizard World Chicago. Uh, at that time, Wizard World was like where they were like the premier comic cons along with Comic Con International. There was Big Apple Con. There were there were others. There was Mid Ohio Con, um, but you know, those are the ones you go to, but now those are functionally, I mean, they still exist, but you don't find comic pros there. You, those are entertainment cons. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but, but things have definitely changed. Uh, and, and there's more shows than ever. I mean, if I wanted to, I could probably go to a show nearly every weekend uh, of the year. Uh, not, but so there's more and, and, you know, I think the, what you can find there has definitely, has definitely broadened. You know, I, I go to, show, I, I go to a show and you can find everything from cosplayers to voice actors to actor actors, obviously mm-hmm. comic creators, but you can also find people making like fascinating crafts. You can find, you know, my guy that I, I buy jerky from that I see is like <laughs> you know, half the cons every year. That's why, you know, so, so you can find much more of the diversity of what's available has changed. And, and I think that the interest base has, has increased too, you know, otherwise mm-hmm. uh, we wouldn't be able to sustain this many shows. If they weren't making money uh, at some point, we, we wouldn't be doing, you know, promoters wouldn't be doing them. And it seems like every weekend there's a new one. So maybe the bubble will burst eventually, but right now we're, we're riding high atop the bubble and it's a, it's a good place to be. Well, um, I mean, I don't like bringing it uh you know, try to be diverse uh, and inclusive as well. Uh, just don't like bringing, you know, social topics a lot of the times into this because, you know, negative connotation. Um, but I, I, you know, for we did have a standstill, you know, for about a year, a good year, you know, when the pandemic happened. Uh, maybe the bubble was about to burst, but, you know, the uh, the pandemic shut everything down and kind of brought that bubble down. And now everybody's wrapping up for cons that's the way i see it right now and i'm excited that cons are coming back so so much <laughs> yeah i think I, I think uh nobody really wants to stare at a zoom screen for for pleasure reasons ever again uh for work reasons that's totally different i do it all the time also you know you brought up your jerky guys so how solid is that jerky that you buy at the conventions that you see every so often at you know cons well, Jerky Man uh, has a diversity of products, but I don't ever think that he hits the highs of the jerky I get uh, at Reading Market at, during any show in, in Philadelphia, um, if, if you're really asking. But then again, Jerky Man does have like ghost pepper and Carolina Reaper pepper jerky, which is about my favorite thing on the planet. So in that respect, he's killing it. Has the uh, Reaper jerky made you cry? <laughs> no, because uh, I can do pretty hot. Uh, and I can do, I can do Reaper flavored stuff. I get excited about it, but it's got to have flavor too. So like, yeah, I mean, like I'll eat the jerky because then there's something going on, but I'm not like, this isn't fucking fear factor. Like I won't just, (laughs) yeah, I won't just eat, you know, a Reaper pepper, but overall, uh, it's rare that something will, will get me, you know, honestly, like wasabi and horseradish get me more. Yeah. Wasabi is, uh, that's rough. (laughs) I mean, or or Szechuan peppercorn because it has like a numbing effect. But but I, I like to go pretty hot, you know. So what can I say? As long as there's flavor there, I, you know, I'm not. It's not a daredevil thing. Like it, there's there's a line of what's enjoyable, and sometimes Reaper peppers there, and sometimes it's yeah, I can eat it to prove a point, but I'm not really enjoying it. <laughs> and that's not and that's not you know again like at the end of the day, I, I just enjoy things that have a, a fair amount of heat, but it's not. It's not a contest as it often becomes with some people. I remember back where I grew up, the, famously, I lived behind two cops and one was super cool and the other was decidedly not. Uh, and um, at one point, the cool one, I also taught his kids how to swim because that was one of my jobs in high school. I was a lifeguard and swimming instructor. And he was busting this other, the other guy's chops because he had just gotten out of the hospital. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the Camillus police were having a hot wing eating contest and this chode uh, was obsessed <laughs> with winning. And so he sprayed his wings with down with mace and then ate them. And yeah, that dumbass won. But then he sent himself to the ER because he had capsaicin blisters on his mouth. Uh, and and I think about that all the time, man. Uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> don't put yourself through that. I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad you know your limit when it comes to you know hot stuff. So that's good. And this is honestly uh, the first. 
question I really did want to go ahead and ask you after your introduction. So uh, Wikipedia fact or fiction. It says that you attended Hamilton uh, College uh, in in Clinton, uh, where you studied Russian and creative writing. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So what made you want to study uh, Russian? Uh, well, it's part of my heritage. Um, uh, I, I really only have three antecedents. I'm, I'm Jewish, Italian, and Russian. Uh, and, and of those, I only ever had well, at that time, I only had one grandparent, my grandmother, and she was 100% Russian. Uh, I'd lost my Jewish grandmother in uh, 95, and I had never had, I mean, obviously, in a technical sense, I have grandparents, but they both died, or grandfathers, but they both died long before I was born. So and my grandmother was born in 1907. So when I went to college, I started studying Russian because it, was, it always struck me strange, even though she was the oldest living member of my family, everyone else only focused on being Italian. And so I, I wanted to reconnect with that part of my culture. I also wanted to give her someone to speak her native language to because, you know, she, when I entered college, she was 97 years old. Uh, no, she was 98 years old. So, oh, wow. you know, like like she had lost most of her Russian speaking friends. I mean, just to old age. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to, I wanted to give her some of that she could speak her original language to. Uh, and and that, that's one of the that's the main reason I started studying Russian language and culture in college. Gotcha. That's that's actually pretty, pretty awesome. Um, since you've worked on a lot of uh, X-Men comics, you know, um, has that help, you know, uh, writing, you know, for Colossus or anything like that? <laughs> well, I've only written like four balloons for Colossus in uh, in X-Men Green. And as uh, I guess spoilers for books that came out a couple of years ago, but are ongoing, like he's currently possessed by his piece of shit brother. So <laughs> uh, or, or some or, or a puppet to, to Mikhail. I, I forget exactly. But um, so, you know, uh, he's been very terse and kind of a dick, uh, which is not how I think of Colossus, who was like my favorite X-Men as a kid for perhaps obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but I do think about that stuff. I, I remember when I was in, pardon me, when I was in college, um, Joss Whedon uh, and, and John Cassidy in their run actually had Colossus use like a Russian exclamation that real Russian people his age use. Because, you know, Chris Claremont, Chris Claremont, God love the man, an icon, uh, foundational writer for who with without whom X-Men would not be the same. But Absolutely. his understanding of other cultures extends to cliff notes at best. So like most like like he would have Colossus say Boja Moy, which I've never heard someone under the age of like 80 say it's like, dear me. <laughs> Um, and I just remember that that uh, John and, and Joss had him say chort, which is a, an exclamation I heard actual Russian people say all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I've got notes. I've got notes all the time uh, on other people. But um, it's also given me the perspective of actually like doing deeper than 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 Wikipedia research when I do have a character say something in a different language or I speak to an actual native speaker. You know, like when I when uh, Psylocke, for example, says something in Japanese and Marauders. I didn't just mm -hmm. put that in Google Translate because I'm not an asshole. Like I, I, I spoke to one of my friends who was born in Hiroshima, and mm -hmm. I, I found out what actually someone Quanin's age would say. You know, and and it's an easy thing to do, uh, and that's not just for Russian characters, obviously, because I can answer that. Uh, it's for any character, uh, and it's a little bit more work, but I, you know, there's there's the payoff of of people hopefully not reading and being like, oh, Steve's a surface level asshole, and they can have other reasons to call me an asshole, but but not that. No, uh, that makes a lot of sense because, um, I mean, would you say that the Colossus and the Deadpool movies was kind of like based off what you had written? Because, I mean, he kind of, you know, seems like went in the first movie went through some of the old, um, you know, dialects that you were talking about. Um, and then now going forward, using more, I guess you can say, um, up to date slang for uh, for Russian talk. I, I mean, I, uh, you know, the Deadpool movies are already satire, so I, I have no notes on that version of Colossus, right? Like making him a Wonder Bread like man uh, who, who speaks <laughs> in a thick Russian accent doesn't bother me because it's Deadpool, you know. Um, and also, to be fair, the first time I met Colossus was in the Pride of the X Men TV pilot, where his dialogue extends to like "It is good, little one." Colossus like rain, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's it's never been great. Uh, so. Yeah. That didn't particularly, it felt in character uh, for the mode that Deadpool was operating. Okay. 
Gotcha. And then uh, you've written for both sides of the coin, DC and Marvel. Um, do they usually approach you with a story in mind or is it vice, vice versa where you already have a story in mind and uh, pitch it to uh, to them? I mean, in, in, in licensed comics, every version of that, every version of that uh, interaction can and does happen. You know, so like, you know, I'm, and I will never, you know, you'll, I'll never pull back the curtain. You'll never know which was which. But, um, you know, uh, in any work for hire situation, uh, you say at the end of the day, those those folks own the characters. Marvel owns those characters. DC owns mm-hmm. those characters. Um, so they can ask for whatever they want. Uh, but they don't always ask for the same thing. Sometimes it's very, very broad. You know, Martian Manhunter, there were basically like no rules because this was, they knew this was my favorite DC character. I've been campaigning for it for years. Uh, and they, you know, they were just, you know, the, the gloves are off. Um, at the same time, sometimes there are specific goals for a book. And, and it's on us to, to either, you know, do our best and deliver our version of that. Uh, so, so you're getting the, what they want uh, through, through the lens of your creativity. Or if it's not a fit, to say it's not a fit. And for the most part, that's also part of being professional, you know, like, um, and that doesn't mean that their ideas are bad, but there are some things that, you know, n- not everybody's good at. I would have a hard time. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've never been really a romance guy, for example. I can be the fucking guy, you know, but I've never <laughs> been like the the rom-com guy. So like, you know, I would consider that as a creative, but if they sat down and they wanted like, you know, a whirlwind romance book between uh, Kirk, mm, Kirk Langstrom and Francine, uh, they've got every right to ask for that. And then it's on me to think uh, to, to think about how I could deliver that uh, <laughs> and, and, and if I could deliver that. Yeah, so I could never be like Beast Boy and Raven or, you know, uh, Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne. Like, that wouldn't work for you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It would be a challenge, but as a counterpoint, I like a challenge. That's why I did a, a middle grade book this year at Aftershock. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like to keep people guessing, so you never know until you're in it. A Beast Boy Raven specifically, I wouldn't do that just because I'm friends with Cammy Garcia, and she would come for me and kill me, uh, and, and I don't want that. <laughs> I mean, she knows she knows where I live. Yeah, yeah, don't have that happen, please. You, you're you a talented writer. Don't want that happening. <laughs> yeah, and Cammy's got a lot of shibs, so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> And uh, you've been nominated for both Eisner and Harvey Awards. Um, plus, you've received, you know, high praise for your Wonder Woman work. Um, what went through your mind when receiving the, you know, those nominations for your work? Uh, well, and a Ringo too, uh, which which is not me giving you notes. Uh, it's just to say that it's always an honor, you know, like uh, and surreal uh, because you grow up. And maybe it's not the way for everybody, right? Like I, I do other things. I wrote an episode of Ben 10. I, I've done prose work and I've done food writing and all those things. But I came from comics. I'm not like a transplant from some, some from another field. So, you know, getting nominated for an Eisner for me, that's like, you know, getting nominated for an, an Oscar. Uh, that's and, awesome. And, 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 and in a way, things, things like the Ringo Awards or the Harveys, they're slightly more creator-driven awards, so those mean something. I don't want to say more, but something a, a little more specific uh, and different, and and it's exciting, you know. Um, and you know, while while I would like to just like speaking of shivs, just like shank Tom King <laughs> and take like a couple of his uh, of his fucking Eisners, like like it is an honor just to be nominated. Uh, and and you know like and then it's motivated. There you know you never think you would get there, and then it's like okay now we got to get a little farther, and and then you give yourself an, an even deeper kick in the ass to do even better work uh, in the future. I hope you win one of those, and I will. I will. I don't. I think you said you don't do socials or you just didn't do socials over the weekend. So uh, I will. Oh, tweet. no, I took so I took social off my phone just for my sanity. But I do. Them. Ah, OK, <laughs> OK. You can see you can see me. You can see me uh, trolling. I mean, I'd be trolling dynamite right now if I wasn't talking to you guys. So, so don't <laughs> worry about that. I'm... Gotcha. OK, I will be uh, once you get yours, I'll be uh, retweeting you and liking everything and resharing. Like, yeah, he did it. <laughs> No, well, I appreciate it. But yeah, I mean, it's surreal. I mean, the Eisners, listen, I did get to meet Will Eisner before he passed away. I was super young. So uh, again, like, like it's nice to be part of that tradition. Uh, and also, you know, we all work our asses off. 
Uh, so, so sometimes getting a get you know getting a little bit of a of recognition is not the worst thing. Exactly, and that's pretty again pretty impressive. So that's awesome. And uh, you've done independent work, um, and you know obviously we've had this conversation uh, throughout this podcast that you've uh, worked for both DC and Marvel. Uh, besides, you know the the romance. Um, you know what's the hardest. Um, you know, between all three doing independent work and working for Marvel and DC, like what's the biggest challenge you face? Oh, team books are the hardest. Uh, it's not even a genre. Right? Team books are always the hardest. They're hardest whether they're you're they're an original team like Commanders in Crisis. They're hardest whether it's a tiny team. Well, I, and then I, I shouldn't say that. The, and then it's just like the, the the bigger a team is, the harder it is to to give everyone you know a moment to shine uh and 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 give everyone an arc i still don't know if i'm good at it by the way i still think i'm not good at it you know, some people disagree and and god love them for it uh but that that is unquestionably what's hardest uh you know because you and it's natural you know as a, as a creator you almost and there's no pejorative intended here you almost can't be a fan when you're a creator or at least you have to like put it in a little box because if you suddenly you find yourself taken with one character and then other characters haven't said anything in like 15 pages or, or two issues, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never actually let something go to print where that happened, but it's happened, you know, like, so um, teams are absolutely the hardest. The only possible harder thing is an event. Um, <laughs> as you can see, the, the more, the more characters, the more characters, the more pressure, but also uh, the, the bigger the challenge, you know. Um, in a way, though, I do kind of think that team books are the hardest because in an event, it is kind of the expectation that you'll have a couple POV characters and then other people will just drop in for, for you know, a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but in a team book, you want everybody to have like their, their to be in the front chair at one point or another. And, you know, I've been in comics well in and around comics for almost 25 years uh and and, prof and and professionally in comics for oh god nine years now uh and uh you know i still don't i still think there's uh, vast amounts of room for improvement when it comes to team stuff for me uh you know I, i'm always doing my damnedest but it's a challenge uh and and um you know, the other thing, of course, is that runs get shorter and shorter these days because margins are tighter and tighter. So it's even more of a challenge than before. You know, I mean, it was I remember when the uh, the first Martian Manhunter ongoing solo was canceled in the 90s. It was the Ostrander and Mandrake uh, book, which I love. I was pissed as a fan that it only got 36 issues, which is like hilarious to say now, because now if something goes past five issues, it's like a fucking coup. Um, so, uh, so that's an additional challenge with team books because you sometimes can't, well, this person will take the lead the next arc. Well, you don't ever know if you're going to get a next arc, my friend. Uh, so, so it's only gotten more challenging. Damn. I don't know that, that much went into it, to be honest. And, oh. uh, <laughs> and you've previously worked on Batman and Robin, uh, eternal out of all the Robins, which one would you say is your absolute favorite? Uh, well, the easy answer is Tim Drake, because he was Robin when I was a kid. And that's kind of what Robin is for. Um, and now, of course, it seems like a cop out answer because he's come out as bisexual, which is, you know, it's me and Tynan riding that bisexual horse throughout <laughs> comics. Um, and I do like Tim Drake, but I got to say, like, probably because yeah, I read it when it felt like misbehaving when I was a little too young to read it. My mm -hmm. real answer is Car my real answer is Carrie Kelly. Because I read Dark Knight Returns far too young, along with Watchmen, uh, and look at me, I came out fine. I, I uh, but uh, <laughs> but but I, I love Carrie Kelly, so that's the real answer. Damn, that's a good one. That's one that doesn't get mentioned too often, actually. So, yeah, and, and I grew up with uh, Tim Drake and Dick Grayson because uh, you know Batman the animated series. So I got both of them. So totally get it. Sure. And then. Lastly, um, you know, to wrap, I actually have two more questions. So, uh, um, oh, we got time. We, I mean, we got plenty. I, I, I'm staring at a clock. I promise you, we have time. So, we can, you okay. can ask me whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, then I'll add a few uh, other questions. But 
Uh, was there a particular reason that you wanted to write, um, you know, for Scarlet Witch and uh, that storyline? Well, you know, I, I try to be honest with you guys uh, as much as I can without breaking NDAs. And there was a reason, you know, when I got Darkhold years ago, it was my first, the first offer I ever got from Marvel. So, I mean, I, there's, they could have asked, they could have offered me like slapstick, you know, meet solo when I would have taken it because it's your first Marvel game, right? Um, but when writing that uh, and deciding that we were going to turn a page for Wanda, I, I didn't really know her uh, and, 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 and why to be excited about her when I picked up that book. But in the writing of that book, I came to really, really appreciate her strength and, and how she overcomes, uh, at least as we decided she was going to both in Dark Hold and Trial of Magneto. Uh, and, and after that, there was a definite reason because I, I wanted to work with her more. She was this, she was this character who, it sounds absurd to say, I, I think is one of the more human, human and relatable Marvel characters. And I say, I say it sounds absurd because she's also one of the most powerful. And, you know, how do you relate to someone who can, you know, like spin a universe in her hand if she really wanted to? Um, but at the same time, no matter the scale, I feel like what she's gone through is extremely relatable. I, I, I try to, I try to think about that. Um, you know, who, who among us hasn't, hasn't made mistakes, who among us hasn't tried to overcome their mistakes, not let them define, uh, their, their, their not to let their past define their future, pardon me. Uh, and, and who has, has among us hasn't backslid and had, you know, had two steps forward and one steps back or one step back, pardon me. And and that's what Wanda's done. You know, the hero's journey as it's written is often linear, mm -hmm. um, but not hers. Uh, and, and in that way, I think despite her phenomenal cosmic power, she's actually the most like us of many of the Marvel characters. And yeah, I figured that out as I did the pre-work on Darkhold. Uh, uh, and, but then, you know, I could say the same thing about Supergirl, by the way. I, 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 I Part of the job is finding out why to love a character um, and the similar thing happened. I took Supergirl because it was something people wouldn't expect with me or expect from me after Midnighter. And one issue in, and I didn't want to write anybody else for as long as possible. And the same thing is happening with Scarlet Witch. So uh, you you do really, uh, I think we can all relate uh, with what you just said with, uh, you know, Doctor Strange too, like, oh, you break the rules, you know, everybody sees you as a hero, but I break the rules and, you know, it's not the same. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a longer discussion, my, my overall opinions of that movie, but I think that specific line <laughs> is, is, uh, is very true, not just to Wanda, but to the experience of, of women uh, and to the experience of most marginalized people. Uh, you know, like the amount of time, I, I, without knowing your specific backgrounds, uh, you know, like I've certainly been in rooms where I've said the same thing as straight creators. And mm -hmm. when I say it, when I say it, it's, you know, I'm, 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 I'm freaking out. I'm being an alarmist. I, I need to calm down. And then when someone else says the same thing verbatim, suddenly it's a great idea, you know, and the difference is who said it. Uh, and so, and, and I, and to be clear, like, I'm still a man, uh, you know, uh, and so like, I still have certain uh, inherent advantages walking down the street and privileges, but uh, I think what Wanda says in that moment is is it speaks to what a lot of what the majority of women have struggled with at some point in their life and what the majority of marginalized people have on some level uh, mm -hmm. struggle with, you know, different rules for different people. And, the, and, 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 and those the decisions of who gets what rules are often outside of your own uh, control. Uh, and that can be extremely frustrating. So. Yes, even though that is a movie where she committed multiversal mass murder, which I didn't think is ideal. Uh, I, I, I do think that her specific uh, point of view there is is very, very telling and very, very true to life. And also, um, when it comes to writing movies like that, um, and, you know, some of the uh, writers, you know, say they are comic book fans, but do you sometimes want it the you want it to be that you know the comic book writers that have actually written you know these stories for x amount of time know these characters really well actually got a chance to write and participate uh you know in part of those scripts well the answer is twofold uh i mean it, i it would be a lie to say i don't wish that we got more recognition for what we do 
uh, outside of comic circles because that would be great. And I think we should. Um, at the same time, uh, at the same time, it's not always, you know, think about what I just said about having to put your fan side in a box when you're a creator. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not always a boon to be like deep, deep, like neck deep in the lore and, and neck deep in a character and things like that. Knowing what's the character's core is part of the job. But some of the greatest runs in comics have been from people uh, who had no inherent lifelong love of a character. Look at the British Invasion. Nearly every genius comic writer that we look at from the 90s, their work was different and special and provocative because they didn't have any, there were no sacred cows. You know, they, 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 there wasn't anything they thought was untouchable. Uh, and, and, and so sometimes that outside perspective can be really, really valuable. Um, as long as you still do the work to understand what makes the character tick deep inside. So, yes, I think we should absolutely get more opportunities. I would love to, for more of us to be in the room. Um, but I also think in a checks and balances sense, it is important to have people who are amazing creators, but aren't necessarily worried about breaking the toys. Because sometimes you have to break the toys uh, in order to make something new and interesting. Okay. No, that's a good point. And then uh, you, you did touch on this um, as well a little bit. Um, so you're part of the LGBT community. Uh, the comic industry has become more inclusive on that on that front. Uh, what are some of the things uh, you know that other creators or creators such as yourself uh, can do to help facilitate more exclusivity and even exposure to queer folks within comics or those more characters ex- as well? More exclusivity, did you say? Yes. Or inclusivity, uh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it more in- inclusive to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's real easy to make it more exclusive. Uh, <laughs> um, so what can we do? Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody's different. Um, I think the thing that every company needs to do is 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 take a, a more holistic approach to how they how they um, how they create content featuring any type of marginalized group because oftentimes and, and i say every company because i really do mean that i'm not secretly shit talking dc or marvel uh mm-hmm. i i'm at, I, this this is a this is a problem every single company has uh and some of it is a is is one of, is a fiscal and logistical problem you know you can't magically have a 50 person marketing team and an indie publisher but the point remains that a lot of people view this content as like feel the dreams and it's not fucking feel the dreams. Uh, you know, like they think it's if, if you just do this book, suddenly these 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 mysterious readers will come out of the cornfield and buy it. Um, but they won't. You have to go to them because they have oftentimes for their whole life have felt unwelcome in, in comic book buying spaces. So, you know, take, uh, you know, to be honest, take Midnight and Apollo because I feel like the statute of limitations is is passed on me talking about that book. Super mm-hmm. well-revered. I wouldn't have a career without that book, but it launched a cancellation numbers. Uh, and it launched and it launched a cancellation numbers because the periodical, the, the, like the weekly and monthly periodical buying populace is not generally is not the, the, the queer community. It, the, the people that are, that book is quote unquote for are not buying books on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. They could in the future, but you know, for they probably, even if they are welcome in, in direct market stores now, they probably don't think they are for the most part because for a long time they haven't been. And that goes for communities of color. It goes for women. It goes for any marginalized community. So, uh, you know, you do the book, but then you judge it, um, in the same way that you judge a book that is being that is actually being marketed to and sold to its real demographic uh, versus uh, a book that is being made in a way for one demographic, but uh, not actually marketed to them or sold to them. So when I, I think the biggest thing we need to do is, is change how we look at sales and marketing for, for any type of uh, content featuring marginalized characters um, because the more it actually sells and the more that are successes, the more you will get. It's not the sexiest answer, uh, but it's also, in my opinion, the truest answer. Because at the end of the day, and I don't mean to sound one way or another about it, like businesses are not, uh, don't have morals. Businesses only speak one language, and that's profits. Yeah. Uh, so, so what we have to do is, is, is help educate them and rework how we, how we market, how we sell these books. So they can reach the people they're for in time for those purchases to matter. 
And so the books can go on and the company starts uh, looking at these things as profit drivers and, and, and smart business decisions. Then you get more and more. Uh, and then this narrative of like, go woke, go broke, which is like mm -hmm. a bad faith bullshit argument uh, right. will just be nuked out of existence. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, um, I consider myself an ally. Uh, my, uh, my roommate, uh, they are female body representing, but they are, you know, uh, non-binary also, um, not trying to trash a big, uh, publication company, but when in October, uh, when DC released their, uh, you know, Hispanic heritage, uh, month, uh, you know, variant covers, I uh, was a little bit offended uh, with one of the Green Lantern uh, covers. I am Hispanic, and it did offend me. So I, I get what you're saying. I know where you're coming from, and you know every every avenue, you know, does need to find a way to be represented in a smart way. Not you know. So I get it. I I totally understand. Well, I just. You know, and well, and by the way, I would say that that cover is not the exact same thing because because that's not they did something that you would have liked and it didn't reach you in time. That's just a <laughs> fuck up, uh, and 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 that's that's a whole different discussion. Uh, but to the point, I just you know, uh, look, I got into uh, to DC at the same exact time as my friend David Walker, and the amount of times that uh, in the ensuing couple of years, uh, and and I'm talking with our books at Image, with our mm -hmm. books all over the place. The amount of times you had books that we already knew were canceled before issue one was on the stands is is stunning. And, you know, of course, then people look at that and say, oh, well, people don't want black led books in David's case. People don't want queer led books. Well, no, the people that want yeah. them are not buying them in the places that you're using to judge the life of a book. And that's yeah. a problem. Yeah. And um, I just uh, last question here um to wrap things up i always try to you know end everything on a positive note so if you could uh you know give your uh your, your younger self any uh advice a uh, piece of advice you know what would you <laughs> tell yourself <laughs> well that's funny because i uh am a person who responds mostly to negative uh encouragement um cuz i i'm from central new york and i pretty much live on spite so, uh, <laughs> it, so, so don't worry about having a positive ending. No, no, I mean, joking aside, it's funny because when I, every time I mentioned that I quit a thousand times, uh, before I didn't trying to break in and, um, my mentor in comics was Steve Siegel, uh, who, uh, you know, cr helped co-create Ben 10 and a bunch of other things, but he was a comic writer when I was trying to break in and, um, he understood that. So I would call him a couple times a year and say, oh, this is never going to happen. Fuck this. I'm like, I, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm just going to, I don't know, be a doctor, make my mom happy because every Jewish, you know, doctor or lawyer, every Jewish mother. And, uh, and he would say, well, you know, if it's hard, you can just quit. Oof. And that, that would, inf but he knew that that would piss me off so much. I would be like, fuck you old man, which is hilarious because he was younger then than I am now. Uh, but um, and then I was good. I was good for another six months. So, uh, I guess the real advice would be to, uh, would, be, would, uh, uh, I would say don't quit, but I, you know, I, you know, I, you had, I, you, I had quit all those times and then I had to unquit seconds later. That's just part of the process. Yeah. But you um, persevered, you know, you continued. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but if there was a real answer, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I got what I wanted. I'm here talking to you about my comics career. Um, but you know what? It would be to not, it, it would be to not study creative writing in college actually, because I spent four years uh, pursuing a creative writing degree only at the end to be told that what I did wasn't creative writing. So even though I'd completed all the courses and I'd completed a senior fellowship in creative writing, I was not going to be granted a degree in what? creative writing. So, How? so I, and so I have a senior fellowship, but I do not have a creative writing degree. Uh, I'm sorry. And, that's uh, bullshit. I mean, I'm doing fine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, but, still, that's but bullshit. I would, I would pursue, I, I would pursue something that uh, I, I suppose would be, you know, much like Russian has been useful in other ways, because the thing is, is that like, I was writing the whole time anyway. So I could have been writing the whole time uh, and studying Russian 
and setting out something else super fucking cool. Um, maybe classics, uh, maybe another culture because the Russian department also is the German department. But yeah, I think that's the real answer because honestly, like you always need to draw from outside things. If mm -hmm. you only read comics, especially if you only read Cape comics, then all you do is make comics about comics. Uh, and so like the time I spent living out of the country in Russia, which was in 2007, uh, well, honestly, one of the two most formative things that influences my work, even to this day, the other being when I did disaster relief in Florida with Jose Andres, uh, in 2018. Um, and so that would be the real advice is, is go out and do even more than you've done and, and live and experience even more that you've done. Uh, because the times when I've taken risks, even if they were scary, um, they're the, they've become the most influential parts of my life. And by the way, that's advice I would give everybody. Yeah. And, uh, just want to say thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Um, so thank you. Artless.io oh.